Welcome to another episode of our Quarter Tone series. I'm really excited to welcome our special guest, Firas Abu Fakhir, um, who is a composer who has been whose work has been streamed by over 100 million uh, over 100 million times worldwide. His work spans a wide range of genres from hit Arabic pop anthems to solo piano works for museums and fully fledged orchestral soundtracks to ensembles with four clarinets for award-winning films. His composing credits include It Gets Darker, Jamil Jiddan, Fixer, Al Shek, Dunya's Day, Love, The Sun de Kiko, uh, Mashkal, and others. Um, in 2019, Firas founded Last Floor Productions, a production house that aims to put Arab talent on the global stage. Last Floor Productions focuses on products, projects that bring diverse voices into a global entertainment industry, and projects that reconfigure the Arab narrative worldwide. Firas, thank you so much for joining us on Quarter Tones. This is a lot of fun. We don't usually get to speak about scoring, so it is a lot of fun that we're able to talk about it today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the introduction. I'm glad to see uh, uh, people joining in. I think it's going to be a fun conversation. Uh, you know, I, I haven't been film scoring for a very long time, but it it has been a big part of my life very recently. And I think it's becoming uh, more and more obvious how important it is for music to enter the kind of the big entertainment world in the region. So I'm glad that we get to talk about it and explore it a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, let's go back a little bit. So for those who can't see the screen, you have like a Rhodes organ behind you. There's another keyboard in the back over your right shoulder. Um, and I mentioned solo piano in your introduction. When did you first start playing piano and was that your first instrument? It wasn't actually. I started playing guitar. The, yeah. So that's where that's where those come from. I started playing guitar when I was about 12 years old um, in school, essentially just as part of a group of friends who decided to do something fun and started playing in our bedrooms and um, just going over to friends' houses. And, you know, a friend of mine was playing drums another was playing bass and somebody could sing uh, pretty decently and so we just started covering music and and having fun essentially and then i think the first time i ever performed well actually you could say that my first instrument was the recorder because that's yeah. what i was ta taught at school for very briefly for a brief two years but i had that was my first performance actually i was on stage playing something on the recorder and then performed at, at the school, uh, I guess if it was talent show, playing guitar, and then eventually got into university in, in AUB here in Beirut and uh, joined the music club. And then in the architecture school, uh, joined Mashrua Leila, founded and joined Mashrua Leila. And that took off for about 10 years of my life. And then slowly, uh, I started getting less interested in guitar to go back to the question. I started to get really bored with the guitar. Actually, I had, I had been playing guitar for about maybe seven or eight years at that point, And I was feeling a bit stiff and my reflexes were taking over almost all my creativity because of, you know, when you play for something kind of an amateur way for so long, you develop habits. And so I decided to start learning piano probably around the age of 20. Yeah. And that really opened up a whole world for me because, you know, you can obviously you can play piano, but most of your interaction with digital music comes through a keyboard of some sort. And that really took off. And I became very interested in, in learning synthesizers and learning piano and learning other instruments down the line eventually. And so, yeah, I guess it's been around 15 years. I'm, I'm almost 35 now. So 15 years of playing piano. Yeah. <laughs> when you... Yeah. um. When you were a kid, um, what were your musical influences? I see a Paul McCartney bass up on, on the wall. Um, what yeah, were your musical in that, influences growing up? That came a bit later. Actually, at the first thing I remember, one of my earliest memories, I grew up in Abu Dhabi uh, until I was about maybe nine or 10 years old. And one of the first memories I have is going to one of the small malls or like shopping centers more like back then. And buying, and my grandma bought me a Michael Jackson History One and Two, a cassette. Yeah, and the that double, was the double cassette. Yeah, that was one of the first 
things I remember that, okay, this is mine. Nobody told me I should get this or this is, I wanted it. And yeah, cassettes were a big part. And I was into, I was into a lot of the more uh, pop stuff, pop Arabic and pop, you know, Western American British stuff. Um, and then slowly, one of the reasons I started playing guitar is because we started getting into punk a little bit, started listening to uh, the offspring and blink 182 and those kinds of bands. Sure. And then, uh, yeah. And I just, I listened to a whole bunch of stuff. I was really listening to a lot of um, punk and, and like metal music at the same time. My cousins were listening to and giving me tapes of uh, Wa'il Kfuri and um, artists from that time. And then when I got into university, I was really interested in the underground kind of uh, scene in the region and Lebanon specifically. Because yeah. you know what it was like in, in 2005, it was really very hard to get, to have access to artists that weren't you know, immediately close to you or recommended to you by, by people who are close to you. And so once I started discovering, okay, there's a history to this thing and listening to soap kills and listening to scrambled eggs and listening to, you know, a whole bunch of bands that have been going against the grin and doing really interesting stuff. That's when it was. Then, so that's walk when me I started through that. Really let's going. go back to, let's go back to, we're about the same age. So let's go back to like 20, 2003, 2004, 2005, you're an architecture student at AUB, so yeah, yeah. This is pre, you know, this is Facebook just entered a Lebanon at this point. It's just starting on. This is end of MySpace. Um, for people who don't who don't know that, what was the independent scene like? You mentioned two bands already, but talk to me about what the independent music scene was like then. Yeah, so essentially. I mean, architecture school has a lot to do with this because a lot of the people, a lot of the professors in architecture school and a lot of the people in the graphic design department, which is in the same building as the architecture department, were part of these bands, were designing covers for these bands, were designing posters, were playing, you know. So it was kind of like the the right uh, milieu to be in to get introduced to this kind of music. And there were not, there wasn't really a very live music culture that I had been a part of, or I had seen uh, developing during that time. So it was just getting files on USB essentially and playing them on Winamp. Uh, yeah. And, and slowly starting to realize, okay, this little band is playing in a tiny little place in Mono back then or early days of Jamezi. So we would go watch them. We would go see what's going on. And it was really very small. Like, you know, like you said, Facebook, I think AUB joined Facebook in 2005 or 2006. So it wasn't really big at all. There was no real sharing of, of culture or information. It was more just friends and photos and things like that. But what I discovered was that, you know, the underground, the indie scene has been alive and well and thriving for a while, actually. And, uh, yeah, very quickly after that, met a bunch of like-minded people who also wanted to do music in Arabic because that was a big thing for me at the time, which is I was kind of unsatisfied with the fact that most of my references, whether it's in music or in film or in architecture or whatever, were coming from abroad. You know, when you're 19, when you're 20, you you kind of start realizing, okay, this is, I'm, I'm forming myself, I'm forming what informs my personality, who I am, and things like that. And I was unhappy about, you know, I didn't want to just listen to the Beatles. I didn't just want to listen to whoever was on the charts and the global charts or the US charts or whatever. And so a bunch of people, a bunch of us start, said, okay, yeah, we want to try and do something in Arabic. Those were kind of like the three uh, pillars of, of, the first time we got into a jam room and started playing music, which is we want to do something in Arabic, we want to do something original, not cover music, because that's all I had been doing up until that point. I'd never mm -hmm. written an original piece of music. And that we wanted it to be in the same vein as our architecture education, kind of like a workshop uh, with no real bounds or limits or goals. It was... Yeah, and I, I never really thought anybody would listen to any of the music that I was making and we were making at the time, to be honest. Was, was, which, is, which is closer? Which of the two sentences is closer to the truth? 
Were you interested in making, were you frustrated that there was no good music in Arabic? Or were you were frustrated that there was no good Arabic music? Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I think I was frustrated that there was no good Arabic music or if that makes sense. I don't know in which lens, uh, uh, you, you know, you're framing each, but to me, it was the idea that I was not, you know, I don't relate to anything being said in the songs. That's yeah. a big one for me. Obviously there's, there's been a history of really good and really rich music from the Arab world. Um, and even that, you know, if you, you know, whether it's Arabic music or it's already been influenced by other music from France or, or from the Far East or whatever, that's not the point. The point was like the music that, that was hitting me in the face, essentially, just slid off and left no imprint. And, you know, I had to make a lot of effort to kind of search for those influences and those people that had already been down that path before. And they were not recent, to be honest. You know, the the bands that I was listening to had been around for a few years, but the impact was, you know, before the YouTube days and before the streaming days, impact was small, touring was difficult. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a big one. The self-education about, okay, it exists. Which parts do I like about it? And what don't I like about it? And where do I want to kind of try and fit in? Uh, you know, all of this is subconscious. I'd, uh, it was just more instinct for me and, yeah. and just exploring, really. Okay, let's transition into some of the film scoring. Um, a lot of people who are in successful bands, as successful as Mashur Aleda, um, sometimes think of side projects at some point, right? It's natural. You're with a, one group of people playing and you're in certain creative space and then you want to flip the side of the pillow and get to the other side and say, let me do something a little different. Um, was your first instinct, I feel like, I feel like scoring a movie or scoring a short, um, or was it, how did you decide to start doing this? I think there were two things that were happening at the time. One was I was really starting to become interested in learning new instruments and I started kind of obsessing about learning a new instrument every year and buying, whether it was a clarinet or a little flute or uh, a whistle or something that I had just not played before. Um, and opening up those kinds of things. And a lot of those instruments, the kind of the learning process comes from classical music and from, you know, the, the, the history of music from 400 years ago or 300 years ago. And so I started getting much more exposed to that and seeing how actually the story of classical music is alive and well in film music. It, it's really the, the progression of classical music is very, very strong there. And a lot of the people that you're talking about and a lot of the artists that I loved, you know, Radiohead was one of the bands that really influenced me and one of their uh, uh, members, Johnny Greenwood, was starting to do really um, kind of obtuse, modern or contemporary classical music that I was very interested in. And I wanted to learn how to speak the language of other musicians and be able to collaborate with people. And so I started learning how to read and, and write music and I started thinking a little bit um, about music and visuals because that was always a big thing you know, coming from an architecture background. So that's the second thing. The first thing was I wanted to learn new things. Um, I wanted to walk in paths that uh, people who influenced me have walked, kind of. The second thing was being in architecture and going through that five-year program, a lot of it was looking at things and watching films and uh, getting exposed to the work of um, directors in the avant-garde or you know, in, in, in films that were not necessarily out there in the big screens. And that was a very big influence. And uh, once I started talking to people who were going and making films or going and writing scripts, um, yeah, the connection was just made, essentially. 
That's cool. I mean, yeah, it's not hard to understand that or like uh, lowercase c classical music um, is mostly found as film scores, right? Like if you listen to Hans Zimmer or whatever, any like fill in any gap, you understand, oh yeah, a lot of classical composers in whatever the 18th and 19th century were scoring for ballets and scoring for operas. And it, this is our modern day ballets and operas. It makes sense. Um, exactly. So um, let's let's jump into it. For those who uh, who are new to the quarter tones format, the idea is that we're going to be playing three different um, interludes from three different films, um, and then talking about each of them. So the first one you selected is from The Fixer, and here's the poster to The Fixer. Um, tell us a little bit about The Fixer and why you chose this. Yeah, The Fixer is a series that. Uh, we wrote and produced at last floor and it's essentially it's an action comedy it's about a, a fixer in the entertainment world in Lebanon which is rich and colorful and funny and filled with um, zany characters essentially and it's it's about this guy who's navigating uh, his his life really at the cusp of a huge change in entertainment. He's kind of an old school. He's he's not really keeping up and he wants out. So the, the whole kind of series starts with, okay, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Most of the people that I'm having to work with or work for are insufferable, are young, are demanding and entitled, and I have to keep myself from hitting them. And so it's, and he gets a sidekick that is, young and entitled and hard to work with and things like that. So it's a fun, lighthearted kind of comedy show that was our first, uh, or at least my first real experience in writing and producing and scoring, obviously. Cool. All right, let's listen to two. So there are two interludes that you've chosen. One is Fix It, and yeah. let's listen to that. Now... So interesting. So, okay, I'm curious about your composition process. I have lots of questions, but the first question is, um, how much of this is you in the studio with sort of Pro Tools up doing this? Um, half of it, basically. Yeah. Half of it is. So one of the big things about Fixer was we were producing and in post production completely during. Uh, COVID. So there were a lot of limitations. Also, it was a small show. So there were a lot of budget restraints for how big and how um, expansive the score could be. But at the same time, it was kind of a, a big, sprawling story. And one of the things from early on that I knew was that Tony, who's the fixer in the series, that his influences are Clint Eastwood and James Dean. And those are the guys that he thinks are who he wants to be or who he thinks of himself as. The, you mean the character? Yes, the characters okay. that Clint Eastwood plays, the good, the bad, and the ugly, fistful of dollars, whatever. And and those kinds of anti-heroes are the yeah. people, are, are the kind of people he sees himself as. And so They're one of the first things... Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, yeah. and one of the things that I really wanted was you know, to flip this idea of a spaghetti Western on its head and do something that was closer to home. Uh, spaghetti Eastern is what we were calling it in the in the room with the director and with everybody, which is these kind of, tw you know, guitars um, and percussions, but the percussions that we were using were ketims and derbekis and dritz and duff and these kinds of things recorded by an um, amazing per uh, percussionist called Khaled uh, Yassin here in Beirut, and then sampled and mangled and screwed with in software to make them a little bit 
different and kind of twisted in a way. Uh, and yeah, the, the first one in, fi- in the fix it, it sounds like he's like playing on like a, like some like a gas tank. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, what we did was basically we spent about two or three days in the studio, just trying the weirdest sounds. What, how, how crazy of a sound can you get out of a derbeke if you play it differently, if you tune it really high. So that's a derbeke tuned really high so that it's, you hear much more of the aluminum or, or, you know, and the skin rather than the, the boominess of the body and the air moving. And it was a lot of fun uh, doing that and sampling. Essentially what I did was I sampled Khaled's playing and laid it out on a keyboard and then sat down and resequenced it and repitched it and added effects and all that to it. And yeah, guitars and bass and Arabic percussion, especially the trills and the kind of the ornamentation. If you don't have the regular beats and the rhythms that are grounding it, it can sound kind of crazy, actually. It sounds yeah. really, it, there's a spiral effect to it and there's a lot of technique to it without it being overwhelming in a way. And I loved that whole part of it. And it gave the show a very Lebanese uh, regional stamp and those kinds of Western guitars with a very brutal sound gave it that weird spaghetti Eastern vibe that we really like. It's funny because you kind of landed, you, you did it backwards, but you kind of landed at Dick Dale sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't really thinking of those kinds of surf slash Balkan uh, feeling like Mr. Lou or, or those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, Omar Khurshid was, I mean, has always been kind of a, an influence for those who don't know. He's a guitar player who was a, a part of the Takht and a part of the uh, groups that kind of revolutionized um, Tarab music uh, with Abdul Halim. And, and he's done some amazing solo work that I listen to regularly. And But it was less about kind of that Eastern melody and harmony that I wasn't very interested in because that sound is not, you know, this Eastern sound uh, or the, the scales that we use in the region have been used quite a lot, especially in those kind of oracle sequences in films, you know, the flyover shots of deserts and yeah. tents and stuff like that. You always get some kind of maqam uh, being played by an eye or being played by, being played by something. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have those sounds in a very different context. And I chose the percussion because I thought that it did that quite, quite well, actually. Yeah. And it fit the character. Yeah, it's very effective. Okay, let's go to the, not the second one. Let's go to It Gets Darker. What is this, uh, before we jump into it, what is it, It Gets Darker? It Gets Darker is... Uh, the first film that I wrote and directed, it's a short film uh, that me and my partner, Danny from Last Floor, we wrote and directed at the end of 2021 and we sent to festivals earlier this year and it's been doing really well. And I'm very, very happy about that. And it's a horror. Basically, it's a it's a horror comedy short. Um, I'm very interested in, in the same way that I was interested in making uh, pop music in Arabic that meant something to me. I'm very interested in making genre films in Arabic uh, that are accessible, that you can watch, um, you know, across the board that my parents can watch, essentially. That, yeah, I, I was really interested in that because I think we have a good history of uh, auteur cinema. I think that exists and has existed for many, many years in the region. And, and the work that these directors do is incredible, but that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that is a lot more uh, accessible in a way and a lot simpler, but still, you know, genre is a perfect vehicle for that. Exploring yeah. anxieties while still delivering some kind of entertaining uh, experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's interesting. It's like you're like taking the Tarantino approach. I, I guess a little bit, yes. With less, right. <laughs> I mean, more, more, um, Less risky than Tarantino, I would say even more. Um, no, but like using genre as a vehicle, right? Yeah. Using genre as a vehicle through which to filter your own um, 
your own locality, right? So you're saying, all right, Deb, what if we made a Korean horror picture that was based in Beirut or whatever, right? Like, yeah. What does exactly. that even look like? Exactly. What if we made and a the, Western that was based in here, right? Yeah. And the idea is that the tropes are really not location specific. So the tropes yeah. of horror and the tropes of action or comedy or thrillers are really quite broad and re- and fit quite organic organically into a lot of the things that you know we're going through here. I think horrors are especially well equipped to deal with those kinds of anxieties and fears and traumas, I guess. And it gets darker is essentially about somebody who's asked to be asked not very nicely to be silent, to shut up and not say anything and no trouble will come. And it's about the journey to not be silent, basically. Um, cool. And yeah, and yeah, making horror music is very fun as we'll, as we'll see. As we'll right, let's listen to it. Okay, let's keep on going. so many questions um so when you first started writing music with Mishra Aleda right you were I would imagine and you kind of alluded to this later is that you decided okay Khalas, I'm no longer doing cover music I'm not going to cover okay computer anymore I've played those songs a million times I know them I want to write my own and all these references are in my head and whatever comes out of me is going to be sort of an accumulation and an amalgamation of all the stuff I've learned to play that's in my fingers and in my mind and, and my own emotions and my own thoughts, right? Yeah. When you're writing something like this, you're clearly referencing a lot of things. But what were, what were the cover music? What was the cover music that you learned? Like, were you going back and studying the music from these genre films and say, oh man, this like ascending motif that sort of haunts yeah. us is really effective. And it's from this film, I'm going to try to steal it and use something else. Is that how you were doing it? Um, for, I mean, generally, I would yeah. say writing film music is a very different process to writing band music or writing uh, uh, artist music, you know? It's a really collaborative process. So like with The Fixer, we have a producer, a streamer, who's commissioned the show, who has a vision for the show and a target audience. We have a director who's trying to build a language that needs to be consistent through the camera work, through the acting, through the delivery, through the editing, through the costuming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so 
when you're writing music for film, you really need to plug into that machine and try and improve and elevate everything that that works for other people as well. You know, it's very hard. And one of the first things you learn uh, early on as a as a, a film scorer is that if it doesn't work with the director or it doesn't work with the producer, it doesn't work. You know, it's yeah. it's better to say, okay, what don't you like about it? What's working at least? And let's work from there than to try and convince somebody that this is it, this is it. Other any anything else is not going to work. Yeah. And it's much less about your personal kind of vision. And you need you really need to be not sneaky, but you really have to have no one to go to war and want to say, all right, I'll sit this one out. I'll change it. It's not a major thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Uh, and that process for It Gets Darker didn't exist at all because uh, I wrote and directed it along with Danny and it was so difficult to have to make those calls alone, basically. Yeah. Usually, usually you lean on the support of a director who has references for you. And a lot of films get scored with temp music. And for this one, uh, uh, I asked our editor, Mark, Mark Eid, who did the, the editing of the film, to use his own temp music. I, I was like, I'm not going to give you any references. I don't want to become pigeonholed into something that I love that might not work for the film because I'm wearing too many hats and stuff like that. And he scored the film with something completely different. And it worked. It worked quite well but it was electronic. It was um, something that I hadn't imagined for the film. And so I really went to the drawing board and said, okay, what do I know? And what do I want to try? You know, the interests technically, uh, sonically, all the interests are kind of hitting each other. But the one thing that I knew for It Gets Darker is that I wanted to do a classic genre horror score in the, in the vein of John, John Carpenter, in the vein of those really formative early works of horror like halloween stuff like that and so those were my influences and trying to keep them contemporary and trying to keep them uh true to the film itself and to the script itself and one of the things was that lyra nadia sherbet right there did an amazing job she has no support in the entire film you know nobody's really supporting her she has a strained relationship with her father her friends, who she thinks are her friends, are the ones who are entrapping her, actually. And so this idea of no meter or no clear uh, motif, just a motif that's kind of descending and repeating and uh, spiraling down was one of the first things that I knew I wanted to do. And, yeah. uh, and that kind of became the formative, generative little piece of, of music that informed the entire score. And so uh, Paradiso is actually the last uh, piece of music on the film and it gets darker is the first. And by the end, there's this huge cathartic moment of triumph for our main character. And so I wanted everything to be larger than life. We were shooting at the edge on the border of Lebanon and Syria in a town called La, which is a beautiful kind of arid landscape with these, uh, uh, with this guy who had built 12 ca hunting cabins essentially in the, four hours away from, from Beirut. And that's where we filmed for three days and slept for three days. And those kinds of big landscapes, tumbling hills and descending into danger is what I was thinking about really. Yeah. It's, it's effective for sure. I mean, even having not seen the film, um, that spiraling descent is 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 very very much there you know it's like is it going up are they ascending motifs or descending motifs yeah yeah very effective for sure yeah um, and you know little changes what i what i really enjoyed doing on this score was uh really limiting the palette so it was 16 uh script string players um we had eight violins i think we had yeah eight violins four violas, two cellos, two basses, or four cellos, two basses, maybe there are 20. And it was, it's a limited palette by all means, you know, when you're, when you're scoring a film, most films that we go and watch have 50 piece, 60 piece orchestras, electronics, whatever on top of that. And so I'm, I'm always really interested in picking a few elements and trying to get the most out of them. 
and writing interesting parts for each each musician to enjoy playing as well you know so it's not like you know violin ones are just holding one note there there's some kind of interest for each member of the orchestra or the band or whatever it's being scored to have some fun as well and enjoy the process that's pretty important for me yeah makes sense um Okay, I want to go to the third one, which is Jamil Jiddan. Um, so tell us a little bit about Jamil Jiddan, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, Jamil Jiddan is a Saudi coming-of-age dramedy, essentially, uh, written, created and written by Sarah Taiba, uh, who stars as Jamil, and directed by Anas. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting work. And I once the second I read the first episode, I was like, please let me do the music for this project. It's about um, it's about Jamil who has a car crash at the age of 16 or 17, goes into a four-year coma and wakes up at the age of 21 and goes back to high school, essentially. And the changes that happened to the world and to Saudi Arabia specifically during these four years are what she has to contend with on top of the questions in her life about who she is and where her friends have moved on to and how she's going to gain these four years that she's had to miss. It's, it has a lot of um, strong emotional core. Like it has a lot of those, those very profound emotional questions, but it has a lot of quirky fun and games as well and yeah. colorful characters and that kind of, you know, uh, was Anderson framing and, ensembles and very blocky colors and it was really fun working with the director with Anas to try and find the sound for the series yeah yeah it's very cool um okay let's let's listen to the first clip This one, next one is called Arrested. Super interesting. Um, so going back to this idea of um, referencing, you know, as you mentioned, you know, uh, there have been movies made in and of the Arab world ever since movies have been made, right? Um, how much were you interested in thinking about some of the film, the people who scored films in the region? Um, 
and is film scored TV shows. Like, I don't really actually know the history of people who, like who was scoring like Yusuf Shaheen's films? Like what were those film scores like? A lot of the, the people who are composing for uh, films up until the mid 2000s, I would say, or even until 10 years ago, were composers who composed popular music, essentially. Um, and even till today, if you listen to some popular music that's, you know, maybe slightly off the beaten path, is there's a lot of orchestral work in there, yeah. actually. Um, and it has been since the 40s, essentially. And so it's existed recently. I mean, TV is very different because premium TV hasn't really been around for a long time in the region. And so TV scoring has been more down the telenovela melodrama uh, road, which yeah. is, you know, uh, back then a kind of workstation, a big keyboard workstation that has a brass sound and a string sound and stuff like that, kind of mimicking the action. Um, but for Jamil Jiddan, I mean, one, one of the things that's very interesting, I, I just want to mention it really quickly, is that, you know, in, in Hamada's uh, theme, at the end of that song, there's two bars extra. And I would never, you know, as a composer who wants to compose a piece, you know, I would never have put those two bars in there. But, you know, when you receive another draft of an, of an edit and you realize, oh, okay, they've stretched that they scene. They hold their shot few, for longer than you expected. Yeah, they, they've stretched that, that scene a few extra seconds. I need to adjust the music to w work with the cut, to work with the, you know, the entire feeling of the, of, and rhythm of the cutting and editing. And so there's a lot of stories like that. There's a lot yeah, of, of course. little tricks of, oh, okay, I need to extend this theme for another two bars. What can I do? I need to cut away without, by, but still give a sense of closure. And, you know, so it's a lot of technique that you have to learn that you don't really learn when you're writing self-contained, you know, okay, this is yeah. the A, this is B, this is the chorus, this is the verse, this is the ending, whatever. That's, that, that's really fun with, with, with that one. And with Arrested, I mean, in general, with the score, there's a lot of percussive, percussive elements and marimbas. We, we, we really love the sound of tuned down marimbas that are somewhere between a percussive sound and, and still have a uh, melodic, Tone. yeah, m melodic tonality to it. So there's a lot of tuned down marimbas everywhere. And at the end of, of the track of Arrested, we go into Jamil's theme, which is... Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about this, this, like, this like very sharp modulation into uh, this yeah. like... Major, major. Yeah. Uh... So Jamil's Jamil's theme is this ascend or trying to ascend and having to go back down. It's kind of her story of I can't really get out of this rut that I found myself in as hard as I try. I keep failing and keep disappointing my mom. I keep disappointing my friends, whatever, whatever. It's a lot to do with the character. But sometimes, and you know, specifically in this scene, we're going from a car chase, an arrest, and a car chase to an internal character moment in the middle of everything where everything kind of fades out and the action uh, sounds and the sound effects fade out and all you're left with is this internal moment with voiceover. And you need to make that switch and you need to make it smoothly and it works with picture. That's always something weird, you know, people, it's very hard to listen to a film score without the film. And a lot of the, what you actually end up hearing on OSTs are reworks of the film score to work as a self-contained piece because there are 10, 15 seconds of silence here because of an edit. There are, you know, a repeating figure that you don't want to repeat if you had the choice. So it's very interesting to hear, you know, that raw thing without the image. Yeah. Okay, I want to keep on going because we're running out of time. Although um, maybe before we get to the quick q and I'll ask you one question, one last question, um, which is, this, especially for Jamil Jiddan, um, to my ear, it doesn't sound like quote unquote Arabic music, right? It doesn't sound like any sort of proclamation. And no, no, we can make a Wes Anderson film, a Wes Anderson style film, and have Wes Anderson style quirky, quirky ish thing. I mean, the first, the first Hamada, you had this like melodic minor type yeah. thing going yeah. on. 
Um, but were, are you interested in doing that? Is that um, something that matters to you? The same way that when you walked into that room with Mishra Leila, you're like, these are our three yeah. principles. Does, is that yeah. a principle for you? Um, no, with film, I, you can't have those principles because you're going you're gonna to be faced with the pre people whose vision you're trying to execute. So that's mm -hmm. one thing, which is the director and the main producer coming and saying, we don't want these maqamat, we don't want these kinds of things. Yeah. We want it to be more neutral. That's one thing for sure. But definitely in, in, in all the work that I've kind of done, there is chromatism, which is close to um, what the, that feeling that we have in Oriental music and Arabic music uh, is definitely there a lot. The kind of instrumentation that I try to choose, for instance, in, Zem, in Jamil Jiddan, uh, there's a lot of solo violin. Uh, and solo violin played in the Levant is very specific. It has a very, you can instantly tell a violinist that is versed in playing uh, Arabic music. Yeah. You know? And so that was something specific to the Jamil Jiddan score that I wanted to bring in. Cool. Um, it's little things like that. And, you know, it really changes from project to project. For love, for instance, just because it's right there, it's a, it's a dance film. It's a dance short. So it's wall-to-wall -wall music. There's absolutely no dialogue in the entire thing. And the brief was, and, and the vision of the entire short was, it's a ballet. This is what it is. It's a, it's a relationship played out in five acts of ballet. And so those were the references. And it's kind of a big pleasure to be able to have that freedom in film music that you don't have a lot as a artist, quote unquote, as an artist who has to have a brand, who has to have an image, who has to have a style. With, with film music, you can really delve deep into something that you've never heard before and start to break it apart and say, what makes this uniquely this? You know, what makes, I don't know, uh, a John Williams score uniquely John Williams or this score uniquely that. And where do those, where do their references come from? Because they didn't, you know, nobody started, created something completely from new. Yeah, and course. so, you know, going back to the twenties and thirties and forties, where a lot of uh, European composers were going to the U S and the only work they could find was scoring films. And so they brought that operatic, uh, Germanic tradition by Wagner and those goes on from there. So there's a very interesting history that ties in with the Arab world a lot, especially in the work of Abdel Halim with the French chans chanson and things like that, that people don't realize. And with the Rahbanis, obviously, you know, that, that huge uh, classical 17th century influences that's in the works of Fayrouz and in the works of the Rahbani uh, plays and, and the musicals. You know? Amazing. Okay, let's do the quick Q&A and then we have a question in the chat as well. So very quickly, um, what are you reading or watching these days? I'm reading uh, a 2018 or 20, maybe 2020 book by Stephen King uh, called Billy Summers. Uh, which is a really easy read and very interesting kind of crime uh, novel about a hired killer who discovers he has a passion for writing. He loves writing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a very interesting, very fun book. That's what I'm reading right now. Um, I'm watching a bunch of things. Um, one of the things that I really loved recently was a series called the bear. Um, oh, yeah. it's an FX, it's an FX original that is basically about a, a Michelin level chef having to go back home to take over her, his brother's sandwich shop in Chicago. And it's one of the, one of the best written shows of I've seen in the past five years. Maybe it's so good. I highly recommend okay, cool. it. I, yeah, I've also been trying to go to the movies. Over the past four or five months, we've had a lot of um, Lebanese films being screened in theaters, yeah. uh, which since Sophie shut down a couple of years back, hasn't. it's been very tough to kind of go and watch these films. So I've been going to see 
you know, Eli Berger and Munoz films and the, you know, all the, the good stuff. Uh, so yeah. th- that's where I am. Yeah. I'm always, I'm definitely always watching stuff. I'd like to be reading more, honestly. Cool. I'd like to be doing a better job of reading. Yeah. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Yeah. Um, there's a there's a composer called Bear McCreary who actually there's two. There's Bear McCreary and there's Austin Wintory. These are two kind of composers who've been active in films and video games and series and things like that. But they're not, you know, they're not the, the list level composers. They're composers who are kind of uh, making their way and making amazing projects. And, you know, they have to have other stuff on the side and need to do this and that. And I think their progression, I think I really like to see the story as it goes, as it unfolds. I don't really like seeing the rags to riches story a lot. I like to see somebody who's in the middle who's saying, okay, this has been really working out for me and I've explored this avenue. And I recommend that you try this or try that. And both of those people are are really interesting. Austin Wintry has an amazing podcast where he just talks about music that he loves. What do people most misunderstand about your work? I think one of the biggest misunderstandings about writing and about uh, composing is that it's this solo romantic kind of thing you know where you have to be really in touch with a profound feeling and a profound moment and work can only come from there which in in some cases is true you you really need that you really need that spark sometimes but more often than not there's a lot of other things happening in life and you have to still find that moment to draw inspiration and come up with something and there are methods and you know practice for me it's really more practice and being ready for that moment and the more you practice and the more you're ready do you realize that that's when you're actually most inspired because if yeah yeah okay so i'm going to do two questions from the chat the first is dalia's i'm going to say i'm going to take one of dalia's questions which is where can we find your work how can we listen Where, to this? Um, some of the stuff's on Spotify. Some of the stuff I can't release. So um, that's something with uh, film music that, unfortunately, because the region is still kind of developing, um, you don't own a lot of the music that you make. And there are buyout deals. And it happens all over the world. And it's been happening for ages. And you know, comp- composers have been complaining about it for ages. But I don't own a lot of the music that I write. And so it's very hard to, uh, sometimes I don't have the, the go ahead to post it somewhere and watching the series or the film is the best way to, to access it, you know? Cool. The other one is from Abdul Aziz, which is what is the best source for music for every genre of films that you had, you've seen? Um, there's a lot, honestly, um, I think for me, John Carpenter for horror scores has been uh, uh, amazing. Marco Beltrami, who did the scores for the Scream series. I love the Scream films, and I think they're extremely underrated um, uh, works. I love his, you know, he kind of redefined that horror aesthetic. Um, The work of Jordan Peele and his composer, Abel, I can't remember his last name, they're really, really good films and really, really good scores for horror. You know, for sci-fi, Jerry, Go- Jerry Goldsmith is one of those composers that has done incredibly diverse and weird music. So he's done the Star Trek uh, theme, which was, was amazing. And he's done the Predator film. He's done really good stuff. I don't really know. Honestly, Johnny Greenwood is always a big influence on me. Uh, classical composers like... 
Bach and Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms, especially just, you know, I know it sounds generic, but there's a lot to study in that music in a way, especially as a begin. you know, I consider myself a beginner kind of film scorer. So there's a lot to study in there. Yeah. Yeah. Be- Beethoven, Mozart and Brahms famous for a reason. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. You know, <laughs> And s- simple enough. The, the, the thing is, with a lot of film uh, scoring, there are f- two websites. One is Omni Music Publishing that has been able to publish scores, like big, thick compendiums of, of scores, like the Matrix score, like the Star Trek score, like the work of um, the North by Northwest and the Hitchcock scores, um, Henry Mancini, like the big big film uh, composers from the day, you you don't really find much of that. It's really rare to find sheet music and to be able to study film scores. And they're very complex. Film scores are some of the most complex um, formally pieces of music that I've ever had to kind of dissect. And because of all those things that we were talking about, extending a cut here, uh, having to cut back here, changing timing to fit the edit, it's things that really don't translate that well onto the page and are not very well documented. So I end up studying the classicals, the, the canon, the, the best ofs. Very cool. Um, Firas, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Africa in general is about pushing the boundaries of what we think the Arab world was, what it is and what it might be. Um, and Quarter Tones is about doing that for music. And this conversation is a fantastic example of how we are trying to broaden our own understanding of what music from the Arab world sounds like. Uh, so thanks for helping with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking. Thank you to everybody who showed up. Um, and, you know, we'll be in touch. We'll talk soon. Yeah. All right, everybody, enjoy your week. This will go up on the podcast and YouTube tomorrow. Please share it with some friends who you think may enjoy it. All right, everybody, take care. Bye. Have a good weekend. Ciao.